Continuing mechanics is a rather interesting theory for describing the physical response of uh, a material body. And so I wanted to say a few words about that, and in particular thinking about, say, mechanical deformations of a body that you treat as a continua and, and why it's such an interesting way of doing that. Uh, so l let's go ahead and consider that, that we have a body, let's say, omega, and we'll draw there, there we go. So we have body omega with some loads applied to it. And it's a material body, and so we know that the body is made up of, of atoms. So if we zoom in at a point and we look very closely, we'll, we can see the atoms that are arranged in some kind of crystalline lattice of the system. And the atoms, if we assume that our, our body is composed of iron, for instance, the atoms, the spacing is about 2.87 angstrom. So and an angstrom is 10 to the minus 10 meters. So it's a very, very small spacing. So normally when we look at it, it just looks like a homogeneous, continuous body. But if you zoom in far enough, you can see that's actually discrete. And at the discrete level, if you want to describe the response of the system to loads, well, what you're going to do is you're going to consider the fact that every atom behaves according to Newton's law. So F equals MA. And these are second order in time ordinary differential equations. And they happen to be nonlinear because the, the forcing function here depends on the positions of all the other atoms that are interacting w with each given atom. So what you end up with is a system of second order ODEs, nonlinear ODEs, that represent the behavior. So ODEs tend to be modestly straightforward things to solve, but in this case, they are nonlinear. And the other thing that you have to worry about here is that there are a lot of them. So if I consider, for instance, just a, a cubic centimeter of material of my iron, the number of equations that I would have to solve to figure out what the motion of the body is, say if I apply some loads to it, is on the order of Avogadro's number. So Avogadro's number is 6.022 times 10 to the 23. So it's a very, very large number. And this creates some difficulties uh, in terms of trying to model the behavior of, of solid bodies from the atomistic point of view. It's simply that there are so, so many equations. So what we have is a situation where it is really infeasible to try and solve the system as laid out at the atomistic scale by just taking into account the forces between the atoms, which would be known as sort of a molecular dynamics calculation. Uh, and really, the points here are that, first of all, the equations are nonlinear, and so if you want to solve them, you're going to really have to numerically integrate them. And if you think about that, and you use, say, a state-of-the-art molecular dynamics code, which integrates Newton's equations of motion, it would take about 300 times 10 to the 23 floating point operations per time step. So when you numerically integrate, you're going time step to time step, of evolving the, the state of the system, in this case, where the atoms happen to be. And so there are a lot of floating point operations that have to be done for every single time step that you'd like to simulate over. And, you know, if you, if you look at a decent supercomputer and you do a back the envelope calculation, you find that it takes about a thousand years just to do this 300 times 10 to the 23 floating point operations. So it's going to take quite a bit of time just to do one time step of the calculation. And if I think about, say, simulating the behavior of my little cubic centimeter of iron for one second of sort of physical time, real time, it would take about 10 to the 16 years to run the calculation. So that's an enormously large number. And you can, t you can s sort of scope that out by noting that the age of the universe is about 10 to the 10 years. So Already, this is six orders of magnitude longer than the age of the universe. So it's something that is completely infeasible. You, you just simply can't do it. And continuum mechanics is one scheme among many schemes, but is one scheme that is very good at circumventing this problem. And what it does is it takes this very large number of equations, coupled second order ODEs that you have to solve, and it converts them into something else that is in principle, much more tractable. And in particular, the magic of continuum mechanics is it takes this very large number of equations and turns it into 18 differential algebraic equations. So DAE here just simply stands for differential algebraic equation. Okay, And 
out of those 18 DAEs, uh, what we have are nine partial differential equations, so PDEs, and nine algebraic equations. Uh, and sometimes those nine algebraic equations are actually ordinary differential equations, so ODEs. But in for the simple case, the basic case, there will be nine algebraic equations. So we've gone from something on the order of Avogadro's number down to 18 through the use of continuum mechanics. So that, that's really the, the, the power of continuum mechanics. And What's even more sort of striking about continuum mechanics is that if you do it properly, if you set up this 18 equations properly, you can actually resolve the response of the system down to about 10 atomic spacing. So there's a great deal of power in, in the use of continuum mechanics, and that's one of the reasons why it makes it such an interesting and important theory to study and have a very good grasp of.